Jetzt ist uh, Kuhn, Kuhn Sandberg, um, who will talk about uh, Femto containers as some um, kind of uh, Docker style uh, virtual machine for, for Riot. And um, I think I, I first met Kuhn at one of the first um, summits in, in, in Berlin. And since then, um, he became a super active and um, super helpful um, maintainer in, in various aspects um, of, of the Riot um, ecosystem. And I'm um, very curious to hear about, uh, let's say, his latest invention. <laughs> um, yeah, so this talk is uh, about femto containers. Um, not sure if I would compare it to Docker, but maybe that's the closest comparison uh, there is so far. Um, so yeah, lightweight DevOps style virtual machines on Riot. Um, let's see. Yeah, a um, bit of an overview. Um, first, a bit of an issue uh, you might run into is uh, how to maintain your deployment. Um, virtual machines as a solution for this. Um, the Linux solution, a uh, short introduction in eBPF. Um, Femto containers, the solution here, and a quick example on how to use Femto containers, namely a um, thread counter, which we'll explain later. And of course, we have uh, some limitations and conclusions. So, first, um, yeah, during the summit, we've seen. Um, we can deploy a lot of things on IoT nodes. Uh, we can deploy a lot of things on a lot of IoT nodes. Um, and one of the challenges here is how to maintain them while they're in the field, so after your deployment. Uh, for example, your IoT nodes, um, some are easily accessible, others are maybe you know embedded into uh, public infrastructure, maybe embedded into a bridge or something. Um, not exactly reachable. And there's a current an, an, a number of issues you could run into. Uh, you could have an uh, device showing some odd behavior. Um, do you have to take it apart, uh, get it, you know, retrieve it from your bridge and debug it, or can you leave it there? Uh, you might have one of your many customers that needs some modified behavior or needs black notes. You know, it wants things slightly different. Or maybe you have a third party, let's say uh, some driver code you want to run on your device, but you don't exactly trust this third party to not mesh your. You know, it might not be malicious, but you know, you don't want issues. Um, yeah, and of course, we can easily solve this. We can just update the full firmware on our device, you know, update, push some debug code, or um, you know, push the, the, the modified behavior. Um, that's simple, uh, but it requires you to um, yeah, maintain uh, this firmware version uh, that might be a full, full chain setup or build pipeline. You have to maintain, uh, test it, and deploy it. Um, and in the case of a um, single bug uh, debug setup, that might be uh, very costly. Um, we have other solutions. Uh, there's modular updates, of course. We could try dynamic linking uh, different modules. Um, and here I'm going for the virtual machine solution and separate out this custom bit of code into a virtual machine. Um, of course, you know, there's different solutions, um, but you know, not going to talk about those here. Um, let's focus on the virtual machines here. And there's a few of those already, you know, existing virtual machines. Um, we have MicroPython, Python with MicroPython. Uh, there's JavaScript, uh, Python, and JavaScript container. We have WebAssembly, which is rather new, but a nice virtual machine. On the commercial side, there's MicroEG. Maybe you've heard of them. They also provide a fully isolated virtual environment. Um, and this is just you know one of the few options available, or one of the many options, let's say. Um, but there's issues with this. Um, most of these are quite bulky to add, you know, especially if you just want to debug something. 
this is, you know, it's horrible to add 60 to 110 kilobytes of uh, flash just to debug your issue or add some custom behavior. Uh, this is measured on an NRF 52840. That one has plenty of flash to support all this, but maybe your, you know, small SD board probably doesn't have enough. Because on the right, you know, suddenly you have a micro Python there that takes 66% of your uh, flash. That's not fair enough. Um, of course, um, you know, would say you could have expected this. Uh, Femto containers, you know, is optimized for this. A lot smaller, uh, takes less than five kilobytes of code to add, uh, just above half a kilobyte of RAM for a virtual machine. And that makes it, you know, a lot more suitable to add to uh, this system for, you know, very small virtual machines. Um, that's um, based on eBPF. That's also, you know, quite the explanation. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that first. So eBPF. Um, eBPF is a Linux um, solution. It's a Linux um, in-kernel virtual machine to sandbox um, simple applications. Event-driven, you can use it for all kinds of inspection inside the Linux kernel. Uh, tracing, profiling, you can monitor uh, all kinds of things. Um, let's say disk latency, you can monitor that with eBPF. And uh, some people even write full network protocol parts inside eBPF, all um, virtualized, um, sandboxed in the kernel. Now, um, we're not going to try this on Linux, we're going to try this on Riot, and we're more interested in the internals, because we want to use this as a virtual machine. So, um, eBPF as a virtual machine, it's, um, its architecture is rather simple, uh, makes it nice, the 64-bit risk architecture, all register-based, and the only thing it, or the, yeah, the only thing it needs in terms of memory is a uh, 512 byte stack. That's it. And um, you could say it's a bit limited, but I would say this is nice um, because this allows to uh, to verify loaded applications because you can verify that an application that is loaded that it actually holds that it can't get stuck in some infinite loop at some point. You can verify it. You know, this is a safe application to load and run it inside your Linux kernel. Um, so this is the basis for our uh, Femto containers. So what is Femto container? Um, Femto containers is again the same. It's a simple virtual machine. Um, it's based on eBPF. Um, makes it nice. It's hardware independent. Um, if you can run Riot on your board, you can run the container board. Um, that's also, it's integrated in Riot, uh, minimal footprint, and it's especially optimized for um, short-lived event-driven application. So something happens within Riot that triggers your virtual machine, it executes, and it does its thing. So, um, yeah, I mentioned a bit of this before, but why base Fenter containers on top of eBPF and not something else existing? You know, there's tons of Java based uh, virtual machines already. There's uh, JavaScript based or WebAssembly. Um, eBPF for us has the advantage that it's, um, it's really simple and in a positive way limited. Um, we only need this 512 byte stack uh, memory. That's, you know, bit equal to what uh, the usual um, Riot stack for Thread usually is around. Um, yeah, the limited instruction set. Uh, the instruction set itself, uh, it doesn't allow for indirect jumps, for example. Makes it limited, but it also offers some security by design. You can just, uh, before executing the container, you can just check, is this safe to run? and then execute it. And for us, the only real downside of uh, eBPF is the 64-bit architect, which is 
you know, running it on Riot, which usually runs on top of 32-bit or 8-bit systems, is a bit overkill. Um, but we'll show it's not that bad. Um, so, um, yeah, isolation. Um, we have the sandbox from, uh, or we have the limited instruction set from eBPF, and we want to isolate this. Uh, we want to fully sandbox our system, you know, protect it, that it cannot harm the host operating system. You don't want your empty container to block your scheduler, or you don't want it to suddenly start writing to your peripherals. Um, so that's done in two ways. Uh, we first have some pre-flight checks uh, that make sure that if you load an application, you know, is it safe to execute? Is it not uh, performing and jump instruction to somewhere outside of the uh, application code? Or, you know, does it does the host system expect a return value and then the container might not even return value at some point? That's all done in pre-flight check. Now, um, sanity checks, do we actually want to execute the application? The other is uh, memory access cards. Um, there's no uh, uh, separate memory space in Femto containers. It's shared with the host operating system. That means that essentially a uh, Femto container could try to write to your UART peripheral. Um, and to prevent this, uh, we've implemented simple uh, MPU-like system. You now there's memory access cards, if an instruction is tried to store or load uh, values, it's checked against a list of read and write access um, um, regions, and it's checked. If it's not allowed, then the virtual machine will simply abort, uh, return a nice error code back to the host, and uh, yeah, will abort the execution. Um, anything else, it will just continue. So. That's how we um, secure a system. Um, but how do we actually use this? Um, because, you know, still need some functionality there, even if it's all bolted down. So, um, mentioned before, Femto Containers is fully event driven uh, or event triggered, I have to say. Um, things happen within your operating system uh, network packets arrive, timers fires. And the idea is um, we add hooks to all these kind of things. Um, let's say we want to create a firewall. We add a hook to our network system. Uh, packet arrives, we execute the containers. Or for example, um, in the schematic on the right, the show is we have a timer. Um, every time the timer fires, we start a virtual machine that does a sensor read. It does some post-processing, for example, it uh, averages out the values and it stores this value. And let's say we have a different virtual machine that responds to a co-op handler. And when the co-op handler is triggered, uh, for example, an external system uh, tries to get on uh, the right URL, we start a virtual machine. This virtual machine retrieves the, the start value formats the co-op response packet and uh, stores it. And the idea is, here is that adding hooks, um, it's cheap. Um, it must be cheap for this to function so that you can scatter hooks all over your system and attach virtual machines whenever needed. So let's say um, you have your hooks. How can you use them? Um, there's quite a bit of um, interaction with operating system available. Um, first, what you can have is uh, you can supply your virtual machine with a context value. Um, let's say in the case of the firewall, this could be uh, the packet information. You can have a return value back to the system, which um, eBPF um, or Femto containers applied which could, in the firewall case, be allow or reject. You know, this packet is allowed, this packet not. Um, other things, uh, bindings. Bindings could, uh, are in this case, just simple calls to the operating system. They're executed outside the virtual machine by right itself. And this could be things like um, sensor reads, 
or sensor rights. Uh, print F could be for, uh, let's say, uh, packet decoders. You want to have more specific information on your uh, firewall to make a decision on. Um, there's another one which is a bit more tightly integrated into the virtual machine, and that's a value store. And that's used in the previous example, the sensor uh, readout example and pro app response. Is um, this value store can store simple values uh, for later retrieval. Like what I mentioned before, um, Femto container is really event driven. And that means that every time a specific action happens, it fires the virtual machine, the virtual machine does the thing and exits again. So uh, executions are really uh, short lived. And this value store adds some persistence between these executions. Um, like what I mentioned before, it uh, could be an average of sensor reads out between uh, invocations. Of course, you know, it's not all. Uh, sunshine here. Um, there are some caveats. Um, it is a virtual machine. Um, there is some overhead in execution, and um, you know that's uh, of course a non-zero overhead. And I've uh, measured this uh, using the Fletcher thirty two checksum algorithm. Um, this is a bit of a worst case scenario because there's a lot of Run a lot of instructions, uh, arithmetic, uh, looping over the whole uh, content to be checksummed. And you can see here, Fanta containers, uh, of course, not that bad, but you know, native execution here at, um, at 27 microseconds. Can't really beat that. Um, and Fanta containers does that in two milliseconds. Um, Bottom three here scores a lot better, uh, like half the time of Fanta containers. But uh, Wasm3 needs quite a bit of startup time uh, to transpile uh, WebAssembly to their intermediate representation, which is optimized. Um, JavaScript and MicroPython, both more scripted languages, are really slow on this. Uh, so I would say we're nice in the middle here. Um, yeah, I mentioned before, uh, um, with eBPF, there's uh, some limitation in instructions, um, no indirect jumps, um, calls, uh, function calls are not defined in the instruction set architecture. And that means you have a number of limitations, you know, you cannot express the full uh, C standard as uh, you cannot compile that. And that might be something you're going to run into if you want really complex applications. And of course, I'm not going to claim that it's fully secure and isolated. Um, for now, there's basic security measures only. And there is some effort to try to get some form of verification, but it's not there yet. Uh, so um, we're getting there, I would say. Um, so going for a bit of an example uh, to show you how to use this. And uh, we're going to build a thread counter. And the thread counter is very simple. Uh, we're going to maintain uh, run counters for each uh, riot thread. Um, so this hooks into the scheduler, scheduler fires, uh, riot switches threads, and every time the thread switched, we check which thread and increment the relevant counter. And these counters are all stored in the value store. So our workflow is to write a bit of code, compile this uh, with LVM. Um, transfer it onto our system and run this. Um, this is our code. Um, I've written this in C. I don't expect you to follow, fully follow this, but it's here as an example. Um, you could also write this in Rust, and I expect that you could also run this with TinyGo or uh, build this with TinyGo. And this does a simple, um, it stores the, the run count for each thread. You know, it gets the struct with uh, the previous and next. Um, thread ID fetches the relevant counter for that thread ID, increments it, and stores it back, and that's it. This we can compile with LVM, then you get this kind of byte code that's, uh, for me, this is very readable uh, because I've seen far too much byte code. Um, and this is, um, yeah, this is compiled LVM because that has native eBPF support. 
GCC is getting there, if I remember correctly. And our own mix is that this has added write bindings. And that's what you need, that's it. Um, transferring this application, I'm going to nicely leave this out of scope here, but you could try this with GoWeb, Bluetooth, you can probably try it with Suit. Um, and the main message here is that this is independent of Panther containers. Uh, there's no restriction whatsoever on how you can transfer this. And I'm going here for the simple and kind of lazy option is to just compile my application in. Um, so on the right side, to start our virtual machine, uh, we have a hook inside the scheduler. Uh, it calls this, um, or this callback is called, triggers the hook. And this executes the virtual machine when switching threads. And we can run this. And this is a snippet of the riot shell. I built a small shell command to get the key value uh, from the stores. And here you can see that we have a thread number two that has been executed five times, a thread number three that's executed five times, and we have a thread number six that's only been executed three times. Um, but I've, I've had the, the, the PS output here. I could show you which threads this has been, but uh, yeah, forgot to do that here. Um, so this works. And that brings us to the conclusion. Um, yeah. What I show you here is that it's to add like a simple virtual machine for, you know, customizing behavior or debugging or just isolating code that can be really cheap. You know, that's trivial to add that's a five kilobytes. You know, I know that there are some people here who might call it expensive, but for a lot of us, that's uh, actually fairly cheap to add just to get some debugging capabilities for devices in the fields. That's all, you know. You don't need fancy MicroPython, just add this and you're done. I think that's um, really nice to have as additional capabilities. So if you want to know more, um, the example I've mentioned before um, that's uh, available, um, there's a set of tutorials and there's a preprint available of the paper on this where it will explain a lot more into detail how it all works. With that, thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. And uh, as expected, there are already uh, some questions queuing up. Michael, you want to go first? Oh, and this is uh, really great. I really like it. Um, um, do, you, do you think, let's say you did do that thread counter, that actually sounds like a useful thing, um, especially in the context of that uh, um, debugger we, we heard of this morning um so how would you get um without involving your application how would you get that debug data out could we create a co-app resource from the container yeah i would say um that's a good one i would normally say let's get a co-op handler for this key value store uh secure it with oscar because this is obviously uh this could be confidential information which you want to secure um normally i would say um if you add this as a virtual machine take this into account and add a co-op handler for this or uh bluetooth uh endpoints so I'm just thinking about the case you said where, you know, the customer says something weird's happening and the device is embedded in a bridge. And mm -hmm. so you, you need to, you need to add something else like, oh, well, what's, there's maybe some other sensor we want to read or something and return it to figure out, you know, I don't know, the bridge yeah. stability thing screws up whenever, a, whenever the army marches across. Right. Yeah. Um, of course, um, one option here, um, you know, let's say you have your bridge, you have your, your issue with your bridge and you, um, what you could do is add uh, on a co-op endpoint at a BPF or, to, or a Femto container, I have to say, um, a Femto container virtual machine, um, which you can use to enable or disable, um, a different Femto container virtual machine. So as soon as you know the schedule of your local marching band, you start that uh, measurement uh, 
container and to measure for the full duration of that they are marching across. And um, at the end of it, uh, you pull the whole set of data from it, or you structure your Fanta container in a way that it starts pushing data. Does that make sense, or am I completely missing your question here? No, I think you're exactly on. I think that's exactly it's the ability to reach out. I think that's what's so powerful to reach out and and tweak something out or examine something that has to be examined in the field, and you can't go and plug in a, a Bluetooth adapter or a USB cable because it's just not practical. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then next question is from Carsten. Yeah, thank you. I, I really like this talk because it uh, reminded me of something we, we tried to do some some four years ago or so. Um, so we also de de um, developed our own little virtual machine, which was called Mango um, at the time. And we ran into the problem that we needed LLVM support for it, and we never got around to actually getting it. And by opting for eBPF, you have nicely solved that problem. But the real problem we ran into is that uh, we wanted to use these VMs for mobile code. So the, the person who writes the code um, is different from the person who wrote the, the code for the, the device where the mobile code is, is supposed to go into. Uh, so we need a lot of, of contracts here to uh, make sure that, that the, the writer of the VM code uh, cannot do damage, but can, on the other hand, do exactly what they are supposed to do. And uh, they mostly need primitives to do two things, uh, which is talk to the devices, that, that there's, uh, specific devices that are on, on the thing that, that runs the whole um, environment. And they need to be able to, to initiate and respond to network uh, traffic. So we started to, to come up with a few additional instructions for the mango virtual machine that uh, uh, do this uh, but yeah that turned out to be really hard so um, I'm, I'm really interested in learning what what you mean by those hooks so how, how can the hooks um, help uh, but uh, it sounds a little bit like uh, you have a pretty tight integration between the uh, code that runs on the vm and the the hooks that you actually deploy in the riot os uh, to get some work done and we would like to get some isolation there so i can build a light switch uh, that, that uh, i can market as a mass product and then have small pieces of mobile code go into the light switch which are developed by by different developers and and the light switch cannot be crashed by them uh, of course it can be made to do whatever it, it's supposed to to uh, be able to do but uh, not not uh, anything worse than that um yeah i think if i go back to uh let's say this slide uh this is the thread counter example that is executed by the uh the hook inside the scheduler and there is indeed there's a bit of an, an um some some integration or some assumption from uh riot here is that um this snippet the snippet gets a context struct, and that context struct essentially the layout is dictated by the hook. So it assumes that you know where you're going to place this snippet on which hook you're going to attach it, and that you, you know, agree on what this context struct means, and that you um, know that it's going to have these two members, and that you're going to do this something with it. If not, like the worst case that we want to happen is that you're actually that you're uh loaded application your phantom container application is broken you know um i think we can all agree that if you do a wrong assumption here is that it crash the virtual machine but not the operating system itself um but there's a bit of an assumption here i haven't looked into um uh, into more specific contracts yet in the sense uh whether we can dictate from uh, like a set of permissions based on from which hook virtual machine is called. That sounds interesting that if you, let's say uh, the firewall example where you're called from uh, to, to inspect the network packet, 
that you're not allowed uh, to read out a sensor. Yeah, I think that that's a pretty long discussion, in which we probably should continue uh, <laughs> offline. But <laughs> I, I really would be interested to to yeah. uh, keep uh, the communication lines up and uh, invent something that really solves our mobile code uh, problem from four years ago. That sounds nice. Cool. That's one one last, uh, hopefully very short question from uh, Jürgen. Uh, whether your example is uh, available anywhere? Um. Here, uh, I can post the link in the chat, or maybe Emmanuel's faster. But uh, um, okay, I'll post it in the chat. Since we are so good in time, there's uh, one one time for one last question by Carl. Um, is there is the VM executed and uh, dies after uh, after the execution of of one uh, task of one hook? Or is it and is it executed in the in the context of the thread that is calling? Uh, currently, yes to both. Okay. So I would say the idea is that the only thing persisting between invocations are these uh, are the key value store. Okay. And uh, how how do you uh, get the space for the key value store? You just assign it to the VM yeah. and sure there's that Current, currently, there is it's using the mem array module, um, and at compile time, you assign a number of uh, elements there or a number of key values that you can store, and of course, this can fail. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks again, and um, then we can switch over to the final talk. Um, bye. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks, Kuhn.